Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're in a series on the book of Proverbs. Uh, today's part 17. And we're going to look today at the theme of self-control. So on the overhead here, we're going to put up a bunch of Proverbs from uh, chapter 18, uh, 20, uh, 18, 19, uh, and 25. And the Word of God says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it's a wall too high to scale. Listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your heart on the right path. Don't join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Like a city whose wall is broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Amen. So on the overhead, we learn three things from these passages about, about self-control. The problem of self-control, uh, the principle of self-control, and the practice of self-control. First, the problem of self-control. Look at Proverbs 23, 19. Listen, my son, and be wise. Don't join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. We're talking about here people who have eaten so much and who have drunk so much, they're drowsy. Uh, if you eat or drink too much, it squeezes out your ability to, to do anything else uh, except to, to veg out, right, <laughs> to sleep. Uh, you can't focus. That's what drowsiness is. Uh, you're distracted. You can't focus. You can't pay attention. You can't do anything. In fact, if you've really eaten too much or drunken too much and someone's about to kill you, there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> you can't focus on the important things. But here we're not just talking about it, an individual instance because of this reference to rags and poverty. We're talking about people who eat or drink too much all the time, who binge drink, uh, binge eat. And as a result, their whole life is characterized by drowsiness. So they can't focus on the important things that matter, uh, like making money uh, and supporting themselves and their families, uh, maintaining family relationships. And because of this neglect, their life falls apart. Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. The Hebrew phrase here, lacks self-control, literally means a man who cannot manage his spirit. Now, as we said it in previous weeks, the word heart in the scripture does not mean just our emotions, as it does in English. The word heart in the Bible I mean, means your core beliefs, your core commitments. But when you see the word spirit, ruach, uh, it does refer uh, to your energy, or your force, uh, your passions. It does have a lot to do with your emotions. And here it says, a man who can't control his longings, uh, his desires, that they're out of control, it's like a city without walls. You know, in the ancient world, a city without walls was a disaster, <laughs> or a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, Nehemiah was a Jewish leader who was exiled in Babylon and in Persia. Uh, and in chapter 1 of the book of Nehemiah, he makes inquiries about what things are like for his fellow Jews who had returned to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. And he asked for a report. And the report came to him that things were terrible in Jerusalem. Why? Because the city wall had been broken down. Jerusalem no longer had a wall. And when he heard that Jerusalem didn't have a wall... He sat down and wept for days because a city without a wall is like a disaster waiting to happen or has already happened. So Nehemiah's message was a very popular one today, build the wall. <laughs> now, now, why were walls so popular? Well, first of all, because a, uh, because a city had walls, there could be a market economy. You see, if you didn't have a wall, then every harvest season... Uh, brigands and, and raiders and armies uh, would come through and steal everything. But if a city had walls, it created security for its people. And you could protect yourself against these raiders and these thieves. Uh, and then you had enough to live on and to sell to other people, and a market economy could develop. 
Without a wall, civilization falls apart. And everyone just scrambles for survival. And second, because a city had a wall, you had a justice system. Without a wall, you know, there, there was no security. If there was a conflict or a dispute, everything was settled back then by blood feud uh, between tribes and clans and, and, and families. But if there was a walled city, you could take your complaint to the city council that met at the city gate. So they could make decisions and you had developed a justice system. Without a wall, civilization falls apart. Everyone just scrambles for survival. Now what's being said in this proverb now is this. A glass of wine at a special occasion, that's nice. But if it becomes the main way in which you deal with life, the desire for it has become disproportional. It's gotten out of control. It squeezes out other things, that the important things in life. And your life falls apart. But if anything, any passion, uh, any desire, if your desire for anything gets out of control, uh, gets disproportionate, it can squeeze out the other things in your life. And your life falls apart. A man or a woman without self-control is like a city without walls. Because you're defenseless then against the chaos that's inevitably going to happen in your life. Now, in the overhead, what's the definition of self-control? Self-control is the ability to recognize and choose the important thing over the urgent thing at any given moment. And the overhead again. Self-control is when within yourself, uh, your desires are properly ordered. The most important things are desired the most, and the less important things are desired less. So, for example, uh, if with your physical appetite, you fulfill the urge to eat things, uh, but in doing so, you're undermining your health, which is much more important to maintain, then your life will begin to spin out of control. In other words, if you eat the urgent things, rather than maintaining your health uh, for the more important things, your whole life becomes out of control. Failure to exercise self-control, in this example over your physical appetite, will lead to your whole life being out of control, like a city walls, like a city whose walls have broken down. And eventually the, the doctor will say, stop eating and drinking like this, or you're going to die. Here's another example. If your tongue is out of control, and you lash out, and you vent your anger, like we talked about last week, uh, and, and you ruin relationships, which are much more important uh, to maintain than your ability to vent, your tongue's out of control, and eventually this will lead to your relationships being out of control, which will in turn lead to your whole life being out of control. Here's another example. If you satisfy sexual urges, such as, for example, indulging in pornography, uh, or premarital sex, or fornication, or adultery, or any other kind of sexual immorality, at the expense of real relationships, godly relationships, at the expense of your conscience, at the expense of your relationship with Yeshua, at the expense of your marriage, uh, of your purity uh, and holiness and chastity, uh, or your ability to relate properly to a future spouse, Whatever you choose, whenever, and on the overhead, whenever you choose the urgent thing uh, over the important thing, because the desires in your life are not properly ordered, because you're desiring ungodly things, or things that aren't as important, uh, as, as, uh, as if they were important, then your life is like a city without walls. And you're defenseless against the chaos that eventually comes in. That's the problem of a lack of self-control. And because of this, in the last few decades, we've seen an explosion of programs trying to help people whose lives are indeed out of control. So, for example, your program's trying to help people with classic addictions, uh, alcohol, drugs, gambling, rage and anger, uh, physical abuse and battering, uh, sexual addictions, uh, pornography, uh, eating disorders. There's all these classic addictions, and they're devastating. And then we have people with chronic problems uh, and sin patterns, but we don't call them addictions. Uh, there are many people, for example, whose tongues are out of control, and as a result, they can't maintain relationships. Uh, or your time is out of control. So you're always overcommitting uh, and never following through and letting everybody down. Uh, and it's hurting your career and your relationships. There are people whose attention is out of control. Uh, you can't hold your attention to things. 
Uh, you can't stick with hard things over a long period of time. There's no long obedience in the same direction. For some of you, your thoughts are out of control. Uh, you can't stop your anxious thoughts. So you can't stop your fearful thoughts. You can't stop your jealous thoughts uh, or your lustful thoughts. For some of you, your spirit is out of control. You make impulsive decisions and actions. And then you say, why did I ever do that? Most of us are out of control in some area of our life. And, and, and you don't have to be a city without any wall whatsoever to lack self-control. All you need to be is a city without part of a wall. You need, you need just one breach in the wall for the whole enemy army to come in. So now on the overhead, there's the problem of self-control. Uh, and Proverbs 25, 28, like a city without walls, whose walls are broken down, is a person who lacks self-control. So on the overhead, number two, what's now the, the principle of self-control? What is self-control and how do we get it? Look at Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. But the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it's an unscalable wall. A city wall, as we said, represents security. Uh, and a tower represents security as well. If there's an attack getting behind the wall that, that, that's unscalable, or getting up in a tower, that's the way to be safe, to be secure. Now notice it doesn't say, the name of the Lord's a strong tower, the righteous man goes into it. No. We're not talking about going into a tower. We're not talking about, well, let's meet for lunch at the tower tomorrow at noon. <laughs> no, they're running to the tower. Why? Because there's an attack. Whenever there's an attack, everybody, say, within 20 miles uh, radius around the city, ran to it. Uh, they ran for their lives to get behind the wall. And if there was an attack that breached the walls, then everybody would run for the tower for their lives. And in the high fortified tower, you were safe. Now, here's what we're being told. Everybody runs. Everybody runs for their ultimate security into something. Verse 11 says, the wealthy think that their wealth is this unscalable wall. They imagine it's an unscalable wall. That's what they run to. Everyone has a wall. Everyone has a tower. Everyone has a, their place of ultimate security. Something they look to, something they say, if I had that, then my life is safe. Uh, then I'll be safe. Everything, everything will be okay. The problem is when you go into an imaginary high tower, something you think can give you this ultimate security, but it really can't. That's the problem. So, so, so the wealthy, they go into the high tower of their wealth for, for their security and their significance. Others go into romantic relationships and trust in them. Everyone goes into something for their security and their significance. Now, what does this have to do with the addiction, uh, 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 with addiction and with self-control? Everything. And here's why. Now, most self-control problems don't have a physical aspect to them, a physical addiction. But, but some do. So, for example, if you have a problem with alcohol or drugs, you know, yes, there is a physiological aspect. There's a, there's a physical dependency and therefore, there's also a problem with withdrawal. Uh, and besides the spiritual aspect, because there's always a spiritual aspect, a spiritual side to it as well, in, in these dependency cases, you also need someone who understands the physical aspect. Uh, but most problems with self-control are not physical in nature, because you need to realize that anything besides God that you look to for your ultimate security creates an addiction creates addiction patterns in your life writ large. So on the overhead, anything you run into as your high tower, as your city wall, as the ultimate thing, whether it's money or career or romance or a particular individual, whether it's your spouse, anything you look to as your ultimate security in your life rather than God or more than God creates an addictive pattern in your life writ large. Neil Plantinga, uh, theologian, wrote an article called The Tragedy of Addiction. Uh, and on the overhead, uh, he, he says this. Uh, no matter how they start, addictions operate like this. Addictions begin when we use something 
that we believe will relieve the stress. Then eventually, uh, addictions create their own stress. And finally, the addict, uh, spiral, the addict spiral down when they try to cure the additional pain with the very thing that caused it. So, on the overhead, uh, A, you start out by being under pressure, there's a distress, so you look to a substance. And then B, you use a substance, but your use of this substance creates another pain on top of the original pain that you were using the substance to escape. And then C, when you start using the substance to escape from the pain caused by using the substance, then you're stuck. <laughs> And you, well, you say, well, yeah, but that's just a problem for drugs or alcohol. But do you know this ABC pattern is the same with any addiction? In the late 1980s, there was a movie called Dad uh, with Jack Lemmon, uh, Ted Danson, and Ethan Hawke. And there's a place where Ethan Hawke, the son, is talking to his father. The father had left the family years ago. Uh, his marriage had, was broken up, destroyed. The son had never known his father very well. And so at one point, the son confronts his father, and he asks him, why did you ma the marriage break up? Why was our family such a wreck? And after a lot of hemming and hawing, finally, at, at one place, the father, played by Ted Danson, uh, he says, making money made me feel like a man. Making money made me feel significant. And then, because I worked so hard to make money, uh, the family started falling apart, and I felt like a failure. And the more I felt like a failure in my family, the more I compensated by trying to make more money, until eventually the whole thing fell apart. And even today, I'm still driven. I'm still driven. What is that? That's addiction. That's the classic ABC pattern of addiction. And at the heart of addiction is also what's called the tolerance effect. You start with a substance, and at first it gives you a high. Uh, and that's why you, you, go to, you, you go back to it. But the tolerance effect means your body gets used to it. It adapts to the substance, and you need more and more of the substance to get the same level of high. But the problem is you can never really get back to it. You need more and more of that substance to get less and less of that good feeling. And down and down you spiral. And that's exactly what will happen if you put anything in your life in place of God. If there's anything that's, that's your high tower, anything that, that's your unscalable wall, it'll drive you. And you'll need more and more of it, but it will never give you what you're looking for. And your life will spiral down, out of control. Just like the guy in the movie who needed more and more uh, um, money to feel good about himself, and, it, and that never worked. Just destroyed his family all the more. And that's why Neil Plantinger, he goes on to say this on the overhead. He says, what moves the addict to the, what is it that moves the addict to the bait? At every stage, addiction is driven by one of the most powerful, mysterious, and vital forces of human existence. What drives addiction, he says, is longing. Longing, not just of your brain or your belly or your loins, but finally of the heart. Because we're human beings, we long for wholeness. We long for fulfillment, for the final good that we believers call God. And like all idolatries, addiction taps this vital spiritual force, and it draws it off, draws off its energies to objects and, and processes that drain the addict instead of fulfilling him. And we're not just talking here about drugs or alcohol. We're talking about absolutely anything. Well, what do you do then? And that leads to our third point on the overhead. We see the problem of self-control and the principle of self-control. Now three, the practice of self-control. And we're told this in Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, the righteous man runs into it. We're told to run to the name of the Lord, to run into the name of the Lord. Like you run into a walled city or a strong tower. Only then will you be safe. Now, what does this mean to, to run into the name of the Lord? The name of the Lord in the Bible has, has many different aspects. And by the way, this is the only place uh, where not in the entire scriptures where it says to run into the name of the Lord. Uh, it's a metaphor. We're supposed to meditate on it. There are many different meanings, different implications uh, to this phrase, but I'm going to focus on two of them on, on the overhead. 
Running into the name of the Lord means one, telling your mind the truth. And two, converting your soul to love. This is the secret of self-control. If you have a problem with self-control in any area, you can start with these two things, telling your mind the truth and converting your soul to love. First, telling your mind the truth. You know, the name of the Lord in the Bible, it's not, by the way, it's not some magic formula. You get special blessings if you pronounce it just right. <laughs> Rather, Hebraically, the, the, uh, the name of the Lord means his nature. In the scriptures, your name wasn't just a label. Uh, your name ha- he told you your attributes. And when God calls Abraham to become the, become the father of many nations, what does the Lord do? He changes his name from Abram to Abraham. When the Lord called Shimon, Simon, uh, to be a rock, he gives him a new additional name of Peter, Petros, Kepha. Oh, when Jacob wrestles with God and prevails, the Lord gives him this additional name of Yisrael. Your name conveys who you really are. It conveys your attributes. Similarly, the name of the Lord conveys his attributes, who he really is. And so to run into the name of the Lord uh, means to forcefully tell yourself who he is. To forcefully remind yourself about his sovereignty, about his wisdom, his holiness, his love, his mercy. Forcefully remind yourself of the life of the world in which you really live. Because God is your ultimate context for everything. So, for example, in Luke 8, Yeshua, he's asleep in a boat. A storm comes up. And all the men panic. The disciples panic. Uh, Yeshua gets up, what does he say to them? First, he he calms the storm, right? Then he looks at them, and he addresses their lack of self-control. They panicked. They lost control. And you know what he says? He says this in Luke 8, 25. Where's your faith? He asks his disciples. Notice he doesn't say, you have too little faith. He didn't say that. He says, in essence, you have faith. It should be here. Get it out. Don't, don't, Don't you know who I am? Do you think a storm is going to get rid of me (laughs) and and get rid of us? Uh, And I'm not going to be able to fulfill my mission? You know enough from what I've taught you, he says, and from what you've seen, you should not have panicked. You should have told yourself who I am and reassured yourselves. You should have taken yourself in hand and told yourself, reminded yourself who I am. Your lack of self-control is because you're not telling yourself the truth. Now, probably the most forceful piece in all literature uh, where this happens is the place where, where Jane Eyre is in love with Mr. Rochester, and she discovers he's technically already married. Uh, he has a wife who's been locked up for years in a mental institute, but he's still technically married to her, and therefore she can't marry him. And he says, Mrs. Rochester says, uh, I love you. This is a famous novel by Charlotte Bronte, Jane Eyre, and he says, I love you. My wife is gone. My wife's never coming back. I want you to come and live with me. But she says, you're still married to your wife. And you still have an obligation, for better or worse, for richer or poor, in sickness and in health. And he says, no, I still want you to come. And and by the way, she's madly in love with him. And so this is what Jane, who's the narrator of the, of the novel, this is what she says on the overhead. It's long, but it's, it's, I'll warn you, it's long, but it's well worth the read. She writes, I was experiencing an ordeal, a terrible moment, full of struggle, blackness, burning. Not a human being who's ever lived could wish to be loved better than I was loved by him. And him who thus loved me, I absolutely worshipped. Yet I know I must renounce my idol. Jane, do you understand what I want of you? He said. "Uh, Just promise me. I'll be yours, Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester, Jane said. I will not be yours. Jane, he said, uh, with a gentleness that broke me down with grief. Jane, do you mean to go one way in this world and let me go another? I do. Jane, bending toward and embracing me. Do you mean it now? I do. And now, he said, softly kissing my forehead and my cheek, I do. Oh, Jane, this is bitter. It would not be wicked wicked to love me. 
No, but it would be wicked to obey you. A wild look crossed his features. What shall I do, Jane? Where shall I turn for compassion uh, and for some hope? Do as I do, Mr. Rochester. Trust in God and be yourself. Believe in heaven. Hope to meet me there. Then you will not yield? No. Then you condemn me to live wretched and to die accursed? No. I advise you to live sinless and to therefore to die tranquil. Then you snatch love from me? You, you fling me back on lust for a passion and vice for an occupation? Mr. Rochester, I no more assign this fate to you than I grasp at it myself. We were born to strive and to endure. You as well as I. So do so. Jane, who will be injured by this breach? If you have neither relatives nor acquaintances whom you need fear to offend by living with me? Jane then says this to herself. This is true. And while he spoke, my very conscience and reason turned traitor against me and charged me with crimes in resisting him. They spoke almost as loud as feeling, uh, and they clamored wildly as well. Oh, comply, it said. Think of his misery. Soothe him. Save him. Love him. Tell him you love him and will be his. Who in the world cares for you? Who will be injured by what you do? Still indomitable was my reply. I care for myself. The more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. I will keep the law given by God. I will hold to the principles received by me when I was sane and not madly with love as I am now. The laws and principles are not for times when there's no temptation. They're for such moments as this. When body and soul rise in mutiny against their rigor, stringent they are, inviolate they shall be. If at my individual convenience I might break them, well, then what would be their worth? They have a worth, so I have always believed. And if I cannot believe it now, it's because I'm temporarily insane, quite insane, with my veins uh, running fire and my heart beating faster than I can count its throbs. Foregone determinations are all I have at this hour to stand by, and on those I plant my foot, my feet, and so I did. You're not going to find a better place in all of English literature to hear what it means to run into the name of the Lord, to forcefully tell yourself, this is who God is, and this is the ultimate context, who God is. Not my feelings, not, my, not what my feelings tell me, not what the culture tells me, not what anyone else tells me, but what does the word of God say? You must tell yourself the truth. It's absolutely critical. If you want self-control, you must know how to do this. You've got to have this self-dialogue with your conscience whereby you tell yourself the truth based on the unchanging word of God, just like Jane Eyre did. She was only able to resist temptation by reminding herself and telling herself the truth, which is not based on feeling or emotion or passion, but on the word of God. Likewise, you must learn how to take hold of these various warring voices within you and tell them the truth based on the eternal word of God. This will help you, at least in the short run, to avoid sin. But in the long run, you also need something else as well. Something even deeper. Uh, so on the overhead. Number one, you need to tell your mind the truth. But number two, you also need to convert your soul to love. Now, what do I mean by this? The name of the Lord means we don't have some ineffable, meaningless, vague, impersonal God uh, who's just some force. No, he is a person. Uh, on the overhead, the name of the Lord means he's a person. Uh, it means he's got a heart. Uh, he's got a mind. Uh, he has emotions and will. And he communicates. It means you can have a personal love relationship with him. And ultimate self-control, hear me well, ultimate self-control comes from what you love the most. Jonathan Edwards, in his classic work, The Freedom of the Will, says you never really do anything you don't want to do. You never do anything other than what you most want to do at that moment. And a lot of us will say, wait a minute, that's, that's not true. 
So for example, let's say you, someone puts a gun to my head, says, give me your wallet. I don't want to give him my wallet, <laughs> but I do. So see, there's an example. I'm doing something against my will. But Jonathan Edwards says, hey, not so fast. <laughs> In that example, yes, you don't want to give him your wallet, but you also want to live. And you wanted to live more than you wanted to keep your wallet. <laughs> so you did what you most wanted to do at the moment. And you always do, he claims, what you most want to do at the moment. And here's how self-control works. In Genesis 29, there's the famous story of Yaakov and Rachel, Jacob and Rachel. We're told that Yaakov worked seven years for his uncle Levan in order to, to win Rachel. Look at Genesis 29:20. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his great love for her. And there's the secret in that one verse of self-control. Seven years is a long time to work. Surely at some point he should have said, I can't believe how long this is. You know, maybe a year or two, maybe three years, but seven? Uh, and so tedious and so long, you know, the hours are awful. I'm out in the field, uh, in the heat, uh, in the sun, in the cold, in the rain, in the wind, all day. And Laban, Levan, he's so hard to work for. How was he able to exercise the self-control to stick with it? The point is, the text says, it didn't even feel like he was exercising self-control. There wasn't any tedium at all to it. Because what does it say? Again, Genesis 29, 20, Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. He loved her on the overhead. And because Jacob loved her, in the next slide, and because Jacob loved, uh, loved Rachel, uh, all the other desires in his heart were mastered. There was an overmastering passion. There was a love that was supreme. And that law put everything else straight. In the same way, your love for Yeshua must convert your soul. Uh, Thelma Paul wrote a book on prayer called Too Deep for Words. And in it, she writes this uh, on the overhead. She writes, the purpose of prayer is to go and give yourself in love, not to go as a mercenary seeking rewards, this conversion of, 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 to love is the dynamic, central reality of our lives. Living to give rather than to get uh, isn't the end result. Uh, uh, rather, rather than to get isn't the end result ever of our own resolution and our own effort. That's not, it doesn't depend on our own resolution and effort. Anyone who has ever made New Year's resolutions recognizes that the effect can even be counterproductive. Prayer is our yes to God. Our experience, uh, the Paschal mysteries of Yeshua. And as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of Messiah are yes and amen. And through him we answer amen and give praise to God. You see what she's saying? She's saying if you constantly go in prayer to the Lord in order to get things, you're probably being, you're probably being driven by your out-of-control lusts, your desires, the things you, that are the most important to you. But if you go in prayer to the Lord and you say, you have given me the most wonderful thing. And my purpose in prayer is to continually say to you, amen, for what you've given me, for what you said to me. That converts the soul to love. And the more you convert your soul to love, the more you get self-control. So finally, here's the question. How do we actually practice this? Look at Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Now, by the way, this is not how we usually teach self-control, is it? Do you know how you typically teach your children self-control? Not with grace and love. No, what do, you typically, what do we typically do? You say, if you don't control yourself, you're not going to that party. Uh, you're going to be sent to time out, and you're going to sit in your room alone. <laughs> and what does the child do? The child says, okay, okay, I'll be good. Why? Because he or she is scared and doesn't want the punishment. Now, this does work in the short term. I, I grant you that. But in the long run, it does not make you self-controlled. That's not the way Jacob got control 
when he ha- of, of how, he, how long he had to work to get Rachel. In the short run, fear just makes you more anxious, more driven, more upset. But there is another way. Paul tells us in Titus, the grace of God has appeared. Now, this word appeared means to become visible. How has it become visible? Through Yeshua, in Yeshua. Yeshua was incarnated. He was born into this world. Uh, He died on a cross. He was resurrected. And what is the grace of God? We're told this in Titus 3, verse 4. The grace of God is that he saved us, not because of our righteous deeds, but because of his mercy. Hallelujah. Do you know why we could run into the name of the Lord? When Moses said, I want to see your glory, Lord, God said, no, you can't. It'll kill you. But I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll pass by, and I'll declare my name to you. The name of God is the presence of God, is the glory of God. And Moses couldn't even even get close to the name of God. So why can we run into it? People run into a city for security. But when Yeshua was crucified, they threw him out of the city, right? He was taken outside the city walls, outside the city gate. He was crucified outside the city. Why? Because all the criminals were crucified outside the city. It represented the loss of the city of God. Yeshua lost the Father. He was run out of God. He was run out of the city. He was hoisted up and became radically vulnerable so that we could run into the Father's arms, so that you and I could be absolutely safe. Yeshua dying on the cross, losing the Father, becoming radically vulnerable, suffering like he did. It was incredibly difficult and painful. It took endurance. How did he get that self-control? Do you realize the greatest act of self-control in history was Yeshua knowing what was coming, having a chance to leave. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? It was dark. Uh, The guards weren't there yet. All the disciples had fallen asleep, yet he stayed with it. Then they beat him, and he stayed with it. He stayed with it. He says this in Matthew 26, 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father? He'll at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then will the scriptures be fulfilled that says it must happen this way? He stayed with it. Where did he get this most incredible self-control in the history of the world? Where did he get the self-control that enabled him to endure the cross? Hebrews 12, verse 2 is the answer. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeshua endured the cross for the joy set before him. What was that joy? Think about this. He's the son of God. He's reigning in heaven forever. He has all glory. What in the world would would you give a man who has everything? (laughs) What did he lack? What prize was set before him that he could, could have possibly motivated that endurance? What reward could have possibly motivated that endurance? What didn't he already have? There's only one thing Yeshua didn't have before the cross that he had after the cross. You and you, and you, and me. It was us. And you know what that means? The reason Yeshua had the self-control uh, that he had is because we were his Rachel. Just like Jacob served seven years for Rachel. But it seemed like only a day to him because of his great love for her. And you know what that means? The degree to which you know and participate and appreciate Yeshua's great love for you, to the degree in which you pray and you worship and you experience that, to that, that degree is the degree to which the truth, it, it hits your heart and it converts your soul. Uh, and now he'll become your Rachel. And then you'll be able to endure anything this world throws at you with the fruit of the spirit of self-control in your life, through his spirit dwelling in you, pulsating through your soul. And all the stuff you think you have to have, all that desire will be gone. 
Uh, and all the anxiety will be gone. And all the fear will be gone. All the temptation and the lusts will be gone. Uh, that this world, uh, all the things of this world will pale in comparison. Uh, and the, I've got to have this and this and this, will no longer have any hold or power over you. And you'll now have the power over your addictions and your temptations. To say no to them. To overcome them and walk away from them. Don't you see? Do you see? Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, ungodly lives in this present age. The gospel says you are loved. You are his Rachel. Now go and make him your Rachel, your love. That's the secret of self-control. Amen. Let's stand and pray. I'd like the music team to come on up. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, today. Thank you, Lord, for this divine word uh, on self-control. Thank you for giving us such a high tower that we can run into. Teach us, Lord, to run into it when we're struggling with self-control either from a physical addiction or temptation, like drugs or alcohol or food or or sex or pornography, or from any other carnal or fleshly sin that that we're out of control in our lives, Uh, anger, rage, gossip, uh, our time, discipline, our our tongue, our commitments, our attention, our thoughts, uh, our impulses. Lord Yeshua, teach us today how to tell ourselves the truth based on your word, the truth that converts our soul to love and makes us self-controlled. Why? Because we're now controlled by your love. You should help us to love you most of all. So that all the other competing desires of our heart will be mastered. Like Jacob with Rachel. That our love for you become our overmastering passion. That it be supreme, Yeshua. Our love for you, let it be supreme. That our love for you Uh, based on your love for us, put everything else in its proper order and proper perspective. Yeshua, help me to love you so supremely that it converts my soul and enables me to say no to the world and to the flesh and to walk in the fruit of the spirit of self-control. I pray this in your name, Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom.